the earthly paradise had been discredited at exactly the moment when it became realizable. Every new political theory, by whatever name it called itself, led back to hierarchy and regimentation. And in the general hardening of outlook that set in round about 1930, practices which had long been abandoned, in some cases for hundreds of years, imprisonment without trial, the use of war, prisoners as slaves, public executions, torture to extract confessions, the use of hostages, and the deportation of whole populations, not only became common again, but were tolerated and even defended by people who considered themselves enlightened and progressive. It was only after a decade of national wars, civil wars, revolutions and counter-revolutions in all parts of the world that Ingsoc and its rivals emerged as fully worked out political theories. But they had been foreshadowed by the various systems generally called totalitarian, which had appeared earlier in the century, and the main outlines of the world which would emerge from the prevailing chaos had long been obvious. What kind of people would control this world has been equally obvious. The new aristocracy was made up for the most part of bureaucrats, scientists, technicians, trade union organizers, publicity experts, sociologists, teachers, journalists, and professional politicians. These people, whose origins lay in the salaried middle class and the upper grades of the working class, had been shaped and brought together by the barren world of monopoly industry and centralized government. As compared with their opposite numbers in past ages, they were less avaricious, less tempted by luxury, hungrier for pure power, and above all, more conscious of what they were doing and more intent on crushing opposition. This last difference was cardinal. By comparison with that existing today, all the tyrannies of the past were half-hearted and inefficient. The ruling groups were always infected to some extent by liberal ideas and were content to leave loose ends everywhere, to regard only the overt act and to be uninterested in what their subjects were thinking. Even the Catholic Church of the Middle Ages was tolerant by modern standards. Part of the reason for this was that in the past, no government had the power to keep its citizens under constant surveillance. The invention of print, however, made it easier to manipulate public opinion, and the film and the radio carried the process further. With the development of television and the technical advance which made it possible to receive and transmit simultaneously on the same instrument, private life came to an end. Every citizen, or at least every citizen, important enough to be worth watching could be kept for 24 hours a day under the eyes of the police and in the sound of official propaganda with all other channels of communication closed. The possibility of enforcing not only complete obedience to the will of the state but complete uniformity of opinion on all subjects now existed for the first time. After the revolutionary period of the 50s and 60s society regrouped itself as always into high, middle and low but the new high group, unlike all its forerunners, did not act upon instinct, but knew what was needed to safeguard its position. It had long been realized that the only secure basis for oligarchy is collectivism. Wealth and privilege are most easily defended when they are possessed jointly. The so-called abolition of private property, which took place in the middle years of the century, meant in effect the concentration of property in far fewer hands than before, but with this difference, that the new owners were a group instead of a mass of individuals. Individually, no member of the party owns anything except petty personal belongings. Collectively, the party owns everything in Oceania because it controls everything and disposes of the products as it thinks fit. In the years following the revolution, it was able to step into this commanding position almost unopposed because the whole process was represented as an act of collectivization. It had always been assumed that if the capitalist class were expropriated, socialism must follow. And unquestionably, the capitalists had been expropriated. Factories, mines, land, houses, transport, everything had been taken away from them. And since these things were no longer private property, it followed that they must be public property. Ing Sok, which grew out of the earlier socialist movement and inherited its phraseology, has in fact carried out the main item in the socialist program, with the result, foreseen and intended beforehand, that economic inequality has been made permanent. But the problems of perpetuating a hierarchical society go deeper than this. There are only four ways in which a ruling group can fall from power. Either it is conquered from without, or it governs so inefficiently that the masses are stirred to revolt, or it allows a strong and discontented middle group to come into being, or it loses its own self-confidence and willingness to govern. These causes do not operate singly, and as a rule, all four of them are present in some degree. A ruling class which could guard 
against all of them would remain in power permanently. Ultimately, the determining factor is the mental attitude of the ruling class itself. After the middle of the present century, the first danger had in reality disappeared. Each of the three powers which now divide the world is in fact unconquerable and could only become conquerable through slow demographic changes which a government with wide powers can easily avert. The second danger also is only a theoretical one. The masses never revolt of their own accord and they never revolt merely because they are oppressed. Indeed, so long as they are not permitted to have standards of comparison, they never even become aware that they are oppressed. The recurrent economic crises of past times were totally unnecessary and are not now permitted to happen. But other and equally large dislocations can and do happen without having political results because there is no way in which discontent can become articulate. As for the problem of overproduction, which has been latent in our society since the development of machine technique, it is solved by the device of continuous warfare, see chapter 3, which is also useful in keying up public morale to the necessary pitch. From the point of view of our present rulers, therefore, the only genuine dangers are the splitting off of a new group of able, underemployed, power-hungry people and the growth of liberalism and skepticism in their own ranks. The problem, that is to say, is educational. Is educational.